Are there any questions? Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Electoral Affairs. Minister, Attorney General. I refer to the consultation process for the Ministerial Expert Committee charged with making recommendations on the government's plans to reform the Legislative Council, and I ask one, why such a short four-week time frame for submissions for such major reform when a routine electoral boundary review by the Electoral Commission typically takes six months or more? And two, can you confirm the committee is publishing a discussion paper this Friday, leaving only two weeks for the public to consider this and make a submission before May 30? The Minister for Electoral Affairs. Sure. This, is not, this uh, reform process is not a rejigging of the seats like in the Legislative Assembly where you've got to try and uh, fit uh, new boundaries within, uh, con uh, it, within provinces, a very difficult task. This is approaching a more um, basic task, and that is how can we achieve equality amongst voters? For example, the member for Roe, his, vo his voters down in Esperance they only get half of the vote weighting as votes in Kalgoorlie. And I don't know how uh, the member for Roe reconciles that with the people in Esperance saying your vote's only worth half of the vote of the people in Kalgoorlie. We think, we, think, we, think this, we, think this, we think this is unfair. We think this is unfair on the people in Roe. Sim <coughs> similarly, we think it's unfair on the people in Albany on the people of Albany that they only get a quarter of the vote that the people in Kalgoorlie get. Or, or that the people in Wooroloo, the people in Wooroloo only get a quarter of the vote that people up in Wandawi, eight kilometres up the road, get. So what we're asking the committee to do is to say, how can we achieve equality? We want equality amongst all these people, row down in Esperance, people in Kalgoorlie. We're looking for equality and suggestions as to how we might achieve equality. Now, now the, the uh, committee have advised, Mr McCusker advised, that the committee intends to publish a discussion paper as to how equality might be approached and achieved. There might be a number of ways, I don't know, but he's going to publish a discussion paper and ask people to comment on the discussion paper. And then at the end of the month, the committee will go, ab go about considering all of that material uh, and uh, put advice to the government as to how we might proceed next. This is, this is a pressing matter. We do not think the people of Esperance, who are more remote from Perth than the people of Kalgoorlie, should only ha and uh, Kalgoorlie's got an airport that jets land in, a train that goes there every day, a major hospital. We don't think the people of Esperance should be prejudiced by only having a half a no, vote that the people of Kalgoorlie have got. Leader of the Opposition with a supplementary. Order, please. Minister, will you extend the deadline of May 30 for submissions, given you've only just made it public that there will be a discussion paper to inform people on options before they have to submit on May the 30th for such a significant reform? The um, Minister. I don't, you'll have to ask Mr McCusker that. I don't set the deadlines. I don't set this the process in the committee. committee. What we it's did, your committee. What we did, what we did, is we handed this job over to a very esteemed jurist, the 31st Governor of Western Australia, and three professors. And, and three deadline. professors. Three if you want to talk it. about, if you want to talk about the time for submissions and all that, then write to the committee. Thanks. The member for Kimberley, with your first question. in upgrading regional roads and improving road safety right across WA, including the roads to the Great Northern Highway through the Kimberley. And I ask, can the minister please update the House on how the McGowan, Love, McGowan Labor Government's regional roads program is supporting regional communities, improving road safety and helping create jobs? The Minister for Transport. Thank you. And can I thank the member for Kimberley for that question? Can I, can I congratulate you? on your election, and I know you'll be an excellent and very strong representative for the Kimberley. Yeah. Now, the state government, the McGowan government, is delivering a record amount 
of infrastructure throughout regional WA, in particular when it comes to regional roads. Now, of course, over the past four years, there's been significant expenditure, and that will continue because of the years of neglect on regional road safety under the, under the other side. Remember, we had a national party who, in government, said we shouldn't be spending money on regional roads members, that it wasn't important enough for regional RFR funding. That was the... At that was the attitude. That was the attitude of the National Party and the Liberal Party when they were in government members. Of course, we're spending a record amount, and um, the Great Northern Highway, as we know, plays such a vital role through the Kimberley. So we'll be upgrading the Ord River section of Great Northern Highway between Horse Creek and the Victoria Highway turn-off, and that's going to support access to mining and pastoral leases to remote communities, and of course, to the Port of Wyndham. Member for Kimberley, one of the big initiatives we have undertaken is ensuring that we have average employment and Aboriginal businesses participating in our program. In 1920, 6.7%, nearly half a million work hours were by Aboriginal people. 10.3% of total hours worked on our projects were by Aboriginal people members. And 14.8% of the contracts were to Aboriginal businesses. Significant achievement and we want to do more. And of course, another program that affects everyone, including in the Kimberley, is our regional road safety program members. $455 million allocated over these two years, and I thank also the new Minister for Road Safety, acknowledge the previous Minister for Road Safety for their support of this program. $455 million. This is a program started under this government. We went to the federal government and we sought further funding. And members, I'm pleased to announce now that last night in last night's federal budget, another $142 million, members, for regional road safety that we have secured. And that means saving lives throughout regional WA. Now, again, with the $50 million that we allocated as part of the election, nearly $200 million on top of the $455 million. Just think about that. A few years ago, about $10 million per annum was being spent on that program. Now, over $200 million per annum. We've been serious about road safety from day one. This program saves lives, and I'm so proud to have achieved so, many, so much funding from the Feds and also our contribution. Of course, the Liberal Party made a commitment during the election campaign. They went out very early, I remember this, and they committed $900 million to the program, members. $900 million. But, <laughs> so $900 million, and, I'll, and, and um, $900 million to the program they committed. But then, when they released their costings, that fateful day, I think before the state election, the Thursday before the state election, they went out to a big press conference committing $900 million, some sort of safer today for a better tomorrow. I can't remember what their claim was. Do you know how many funds were actually allocated in their costings the two days before the election? After they went out and made an announcement of $900 million? Do you know how many dollars? Zero. 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 That's how treated road safety. You went out on the side of the road down in Albany, made a big initiative, got all these third parties welcoming your announcement. And to tell you the truth, I was a bit shocked. I was like, that's a big announcement. <laughs> but we, we were sensible. We said, we'll allocate 50, we'll go to the Commonwealth and get more. What did they do? They, went out, they announced 900 and they allocated zero dollars in their costings document. We've taken it seriously. We've worked with the Commonwealth and we're out there improving infrastructure throughout regional WA. The <coughs> member for Vass. Uh, my, my question is to the Minister for Health. Uh, I refer to reports that multiple hotel quarantine staff have been under investigation for holding second jobs in contravention of your government's second jobs ban. And I ask, uh, one, is the Department of Health investigating multiple workers for breaching the second jobs rule? And if so, were these additional, where were these additional jobs and uh, which hotels did the staff uh, work in? 
Minister for Health. Madam Speaker, thanks very much for the question, Member. And um, once again, it gives me the opportunity to get up and just talk about how important our hotel quarantining system is for keeping Western Australians safe. Almost 45,000 people have now come through our hotel quarantine with just a small handful of incidents to report during that time. Uh, it has been incredibly effective at keeping Western Australians safe and, as the member alludes to, uh, making sure that we keep our staff members safe and they keep their <coughs> families safe is an important element of, of that process. And As the, the Premier has outlined on numerous occasions, we now require each of our hotel quarantine staff to undertake daily testing in relation to COVID-19 plus weekly PCR testing. We require them to wear the appropriate PPE as well as to undertake extensive training in infection protection and control. We expect them to be able to manage the, 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 the circumstances in which they work properly so that they can keep themselves out of harm's way. And in particular, uh, uh, Madam <coughs> Speaker, recent, uh, we've recently introduced the mandatory vaccine, vaccination policy for all workers or all people coming on to what's called a, a red zone in relation to our hotel quarantining system to make sure that the, we protect those staff and that we make sure that they can protect their families and friends. In addition to that, Madam Speaker, we also uh, some time back instituted a rule which would require our, particularly our security guards working in a hotel quarantine environment to commit to a single point of employment and we compensated them for that utilising a 40 per cent loading in relation to their, to their wages. This was negotiated with, the, with their contractors, uh, the various security firms within uh, that, that uh, contract to our hotel quarantining system. As a result of that, the Department of Health continues to work with the contractors to make sure they have oversight of their staff. Their staff are required to, um, to fill out a statutory declaration to say that they won't take on additional, uh, additional work. And we continue to work with those contractors to make sure that they have oversight in relation to their activities. Obviously, it's hard to police, Madam Speaker. We can't uh, you know, reach out into, we can't visit people in their homes to say, are you working tonight? Uh, what are you doing um, on your day? off, but we obviously can continue to liaise with them uh, in, in the team-like environment which we do. And the fact that we've had a worker who has been identified as having taken on secondary employment, uh, uh, that we can then move swiftly to take them out of the um, hotel quarantining arrangements and they can then uh, continue to enjoy their lives in that secondary employment but not inside our hotel quarantine system. Um, the member for Vass with a supplementary. Uh, just further um, to my original question, uh, what were the additional jobs uh, that the additional jobs that these workers were undertaking? Minister for Health. Yeah. Uh, Madam Speaker, I don't have that information to hand, nor I think the other part of your question, which was which hotel were they working mm. at. But obviously, uh, you, you would be familiar with uh, people who work in these industries, and you can imagine the sort of um, extra roles uh, that they would take on from time to time. As I've said, and as the Premier has said, it's not on. And that's why we've compensated them for, uh, for having to the single uh, employment role, and that's why we work closely with their contract uh, employers to make sure that we have proper oversight. The member for Pilbara. Madam Speaker, congratulations on being appointed as the Minister for the House and the first woman Speaker of the House. Thank you. My question is to the Minister for Health. I refer to the McGovern Labour government's record investment in hospitals right across the state and its commitment to enhance services in regional Western Australia. And I ask, Minister, can you please provide an update to the House on the upgrades to the Tom Price and Newman Hospital? And can the minister outline what this investment will mean for those communities across the Pilbara? Minister for Health. Madam Speaker, I thank the member for the question and in doing so, congratulate him on his resounding victory in the, in the seat of Pilbara. Clearly the people of Pilbara recognise that they have a great advocate in the member for Pilbara, uh, Madam Speaker, and it was, we were delighted to see uh, that him returned with such resounding results, so congratulations to you. And Madam Speaker, the people of the Pilbara of course can see his work in action. 
advocating for uh, for health, good health services for the people of Pilbara, and in particular, Madam Speaker, um, the McGowan government's commitment towards the $61.4 million human health health service redevelopment, which includes a $15 million contribution to B by BHP Iron Ore. It'd be, everyone will be pleased, particularly the member for Pilbara, Madam Speaker, to know that it's progressing well. This redevelopment will include an expanded six-bay emergency department, 12 inpatient beds, an outpatient centre, medical imaging, pathology, GP cons consultation spaces and two dental chairs. The first stage of this re redevelopment is due to be completed in 2022, uh, with the hospital expected to be fully opened in 2023. And Madam Speaker, of course, an important element of any upgrades of our regional health services is that digital enablement which makes sure that people going to that hospital can benefit from, uh, from telehealth services and emergency telehealth services when they go there. In addition to that, Madam Speaker, I was very, very proud to see a commitment to the Tom Price Hospital, which, uh, will which will see it being built on a completely new greenfield site. Planning for this $32.8 million facility, which includes a $20 million contribution from Rio Tinto is already underway. And the Tom Price design is anticipated to include a modern emergency department and with, with private interview room, consulting rooms for visitor services. So right across the Pilbara, member from Pilbara, you can see great upgrades taking place. And this, of course, you know, particularly in relation to Tom Price, it means that those people visiting Karajini who require medical services know that they'll have a, a world-class uh, hospital uh, service available to them in the event that they need it. These hospitals, Madam Speaker, will complement the fantastic facilities we also have at the Karatha Health Campus and the Headland Health Campus. And as the member is aware, we are also undertaking major redevelopments of several other regional hospitals, including Geraldton Health Campus, um, which is under, undergoing a massive redevelopment, a $200 million redevelopment at, at Bunbury Hospital, as well as building a radiotherapy suite at at Albany Health Campus and, of course, member for Kalgoorlie, the MRI continues to be uh, developed at Kalgoorlie Health Campus at PACE. So, Madam Speaker, this government is fully committed, committed to improving health care services to patients wherever they live and when they do have to travel, we are also committed to improving PATS system. And I'm proud of our recent election commitment to increase the PATS accommodation subsidy uh, to $100 and expand the eligibility criteria for support persons for vulnerable uh, patients. I look forward to updating the House, Madam Speaker, on these Pilbara and other regional projects over the coming months, as they are examples of the... Of what? So please don't interject. You'll well, have your remember, own chance to ask the question. To that, remember, you'll be very pleased to hear we're also undertaking a massive rebuild at the Laverton Hospital, thanks to our friends of the Commonwealth who are supporting our agenda for health care. And I very much look forward to working on the Mika Thara Hospital. But these are all examples, Madam Speaker, of the continued commitment that McGowan has to country health services and for putting people, Western Australians and all patients first. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health, and I note that some notice has been given. I refer to yesterday's news that the quarantine advisory panel has finally been established, more than 60 days after Professor Wiramanthri recommended it, and I ask, one, who is the chair of the advisory panel? Two, who will be on the advisory panel? Three, what are the terms of reference? Four, how often will the panel meet and report to the minister? And five, will the panel's progress in assuring the implementation of improvements to the hotel quarantine system be published? Madam Speaker. Minister for Health. Madam Speaker, I thank the member for, which, uh, uh, for some notice of this question, and I'm in a position to advise that the composition of the panel is being finalised in the, these coming days. The panel will comprise senior personnel from key government agencies and independent experts. The Department of Health is in the process of finalising the terms of reference, and this will be outlined. Uh, and uh, for points four and five, will be out. These are matters in terms of how often will the panel report to the minister. And and how will the, will the panel's progress in assuring the implementation of improvements to the hotel quarantine system be published? Uh, this will be outlined in the final terms of reference. Supplementary. A supplementary question. Minister, why, when this was a key recommendation of your, and accepted by the government in your response, has it taken so long to finalise such an important part of the government's response to COVID management in relation to quarantine hotels? 
Minister for Health. Madam Speaker, I want to address the premise of the question and the tone in, rela in, in relation to that, and that is to suggest that the government is somehow ignorant of expert advice in relation to hotel quarantine and that we're not acting on that advice. Obviously, Professor Weir Mantri provided an expert report to us, supported by other panel panellists in relation to his inquiry, and they have continued to inform us in relation to how we can continue to improve hotel quarantining. We have a continuous improvement program, Madam Speaker, learnt from both expert advice and testimony and with experience, and we continue to make sure those improvements are implemented. But in addition to that, Madam Speaker, uh, we will can uh, the uh, the member will be aware that over the past few months we have been focused on a particular element of the Weir Mantry report, which is around the ventilation components of it and how that impacts in terms of the quality and safety of the guests uh, of the services we provide to the guests staying at the hotel and the staff working in, to, in those hotel arrangements. So the member will be aware that we've made a range of decisions in relation to that, including the retirement of three hotels uh, in, in terms of what's regarded, what's uh, nominally termed our chic hotel. Hotels, uh, because uh, that advice provided us uh, gave us calls to to make sure what, that they were taken. That was with the pay. So, Madam Speaker, the member for Vass will be familiar with this nomenclature, which means uh, the State Health Incident Control Centre, which is chic. Oh, chic. <laughs> there we go. C for the carry on. Minister. And it's language that we've used for some 15 months now, and, um, and, and obviously it's become part of, part of the vernacular when it comes to um, when it comes to our hotel quarantining and, indeed, all that in relation to our response to the pandemic. Uh, and uh, so the member will be aware that there's been significant uh, upgrades and improvements to the way we deliver um, um, those, uh, that element of our response to the pandemic. And this is another element which will take its place as we continue to improve the um, hotel quarantining system. Okay. Member for Dawesville. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Fisheries. I refer to the state government's commitment to help keep people safe in the ocean and the mitigating the risk of fatal shark attacks. And I ask, can the minister please update the House on the conclusion of the non-lethal shark drumline trial? And also, and can the minister also outline to the House what means, what sorry, what measures the McGowan government is taking to ensure the continued safety and confidence of those using WA's beaches? Minister for Fisheries. Madam Speaker, I thank the member for Dawesville for the question and I'd like to take the opportunity to congratulate her on her emphatic win and note the excitement coming out of the electorate of Dawesville since she's been elected. So the McGowan Labor government is committed to keeping people as safe as possible in Western Australia. Now that includes our ocean users and our coastal communities. The Smart Drumline trial commenced in 2019 and has now come to a close, having provided valuable findings to the government which allow us to base our decisions on strong scientific evidence and expert advice. The independent review by the chief scientist, Professor Peter Clinkin, has concluded the trial was extremely well designed and implemented in a highly skillful manner. And I do want to extend my thanks to the contractors who have been out there over the past two years conducting the trial. Now, Professor Clinkin has also concluded, Madam Speaker, that the science does not support a continuation of this technology for our unique coast. And on the recommendation of the chief scientists, the trial will conclude on its scheduled end date of the 20th of May 2021. An additional investment will be made into the highly effective approach of tagging white sharks. We're going to increase our support for shark hazard mitigation measures that we know are helping to keep our ocean users and our communities as safe as possible. Now, members, the McGowan government will spend an additional $5 million over the next four years to deliver a highly successful shark mitigation program, including increasing white shark tagging operations, upgrades to the state's shark monitoring network, support for beach enclosures at our popular beaches, and continuing the personal shark deterrent devices rebate scheme for surfers and divers, which we know has been very popular. The success of our targeted shark tagging program has been remarkable, with 22 white shark sharks tagged last year off the WA coast, and another nine this year, and a total of, that's a total of 31 since 2020, and 51 white sharks were captured throughout the program since 2019, 
compared to just two through the Smart Drum 9 trial through the same period. So we're providing additional funding of $2.8 million to increase that valuable tagging work and upgrade the state's shark monitoring network receivers. This will enable our highly experienced shark tagging team to spend more time on the water with the best chance of tagging white sharks. The McGowan government will upgrade the shark monitoring network itself by increasing the range of our 34 receivers to provide near real-time alerts of the presence of tagged sharks. And this valuable data and monitoring will, co will contribute to our capacity, importantly, to predict shark behaviour and respond accordingly using our suite of shark mitigation measures. There are already the, the upgrades to next generation digital live VR4 receivers over the next four years means detection of tagged sharks will have a longer range of up to 800 metres, a wider detection zone than the 500 metres currently in use. There are already two new generation receivers in place at Bunker Bay and will upgrade the remaining 32 receivers along the coast from Perth, south to Geograph Bay, Yallingup, Greystown, Albany and Esperance. Madam Speaker, the McGowan Government is investing in shark hazard mitigation measures backed by strong scientific evidence and expert advice to help keep WA Ocean users and our communities as safe as possible. The Leader of the Liberal Party. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And just before I ask my question, I did want to add to the comments by the Minister for Health in recognising International Nurses Day uh, today and International Midwives Day uh, last Wednesday and uh, recognise the enormous contribution they make to the quality of our lives. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Finance, and I think perhaps your inaugural question, Minister for Finance. I refer to your response to a question in the Legislative Council on the 4th of May regarding the administration of the $500 power rebate from the February five-day uh, five lockdown, and I ask how many small businesses and charities are eligible for the $500 uh, uh, the $500 rebate, how many of the businesses are not customers of Synergy or Horizon Power and therefore have not received the $500 assistance? And two, why is it taking until mid-June before those impacted small businesses can even apply for assistance that they were promised? The Minister for Finance. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam Speaker. In regards to the actual numbers uh, that are entitled to it and the, and the application Obviously, as you, as you even said in your uh, question, why is it taking some time to June? Well, of course, we won't know how many people have applied if the process is being implemented at the moment. I am unaware. I will uh, find out the numbers that are entitled to, but I can assure you it's a significant amount, which I'm sure you would be applauding that we are providing this to uh, businesses that may require it. Um, it's not just a thing that you can just turn on the tap and give the money out tomorrow, member. Well, this is a prudent, physically responsible government. This is taxpayers' money. It's, a mum, um, it's the money of mums and dads. We have to do it correctly. And as you know, the Department of Finance is engaged in a number of programs in uh, providing grants in a number of areas. It does take some time to get the systems up. That is what we are doing, and in due course, the process will be implemented, and those that should be awarded the credit will be awarded the credits. The, Speaker. The uh, Leader of the Liberal Party with a supplementary. Thank you very much, Speaker. Minister, why is it taking 42 Department of Finance bureaucrats to administer this $500 power rebate, especially given it will largely be managed by Synergy and Horizon Power, and could this money be better spent elsewhere? Read your own budget. The Minister of Finance. Yeah. Sir, your question was whether this money would be... Uh, if I may, yes. Yes. Speak. Yeah. thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, that 42 staff, and this is out of your own government's papers, 42 staff are being taken on to administer the $500 mm. rebate yeah. uh, in the Department of Finance. Well, uh, this is interesting, uh, Member. One minute you're saying, why are we delaying it? And now you complain that we're putting on extra resources to, to manage it. I mean, what do you want? Do you want us, Member, Member for Council, should we June. just stay with the existing staff and, and the grant program will start next year? Or do you want I want to take on extra staff so we can try and process it as quickly as They're possible. They're not in synergy of the horizon. What do you want? What do you want now? Give me an answer. You want it now. What would you prefer? You want it now. Right. You're not delivering it 
until June. You want the grants to be delivered now. You're you not delivering it until June. To start to try and speed up the process. What You're not you delivering it till June, and the, and the synergy of the rise... No, sorry. Be Member for Cottesloe, yeah, you've made your point. Can, can we have a response a, just from uh, the Minister? A more defined question as to what you actually want, so then I might be able to answer your question. Thanks, Minister. <laughs> Member for Geraldton. My question is to the Minister for Child Protection. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's commitment to keeping children safe and its efforts to address the over-representation of Aboriginal children in out-of-home care. And I ask, can the Minister update the House on the Aboriginal family-led decision-making pilot in Geraldton and outline what it will mean when it comes to delivering positive outcomes for vulnerable children? The Minister for Child Protection. Madam Speaker, I thank the member very much for the question and uh, it was fantastic to be with her up in Geraldton um, last week uh, and uh, announce a particular initiative that I'm very proud of and I think uh, we'll start to see some significant changes uh, in the way that child protection decision making is made uh, in, in Western Australia. Sadly, uh, Aboriginal children are overrepresented in our child protection system. Nearly 57 per cent of our children in out-of-home care are Aboriginal, and members might be aware that it's a new measure in the Closing the Gap targets uh, that we reduce the number of children, Aboriginal children in care. Of course, it's a difficult um, objective because we need to keep children safe. So we can't just say that we will take less children into care. Our objective is to keep children safe. And that means we need to work on early intervention with families whose children are at risk of coming into care. And of course, we've invested new money into that and allocated uh, some of that money to dedicated Aboriginal organisations. And so far, the uh, results look very promising. And we're also looking at do doing things differently. So we will be reintroducing amendments to the Children and Community Services Act, that's the child protection legislation in this state, to increase the increase in the legislation the role of Aboriginal organisations once a child is a decision has been made for a child to come into care, the role that Aboriginal organisations and Aboriginal families have in deciding where those children are placed. Um, one of the uh, good models um, that many advocates have um, been pressing us to implement is called Aboriginal family-led decision-making, and this is uh, implemented particularly in Victoria and Queensland, and I'm very proud that our government has funded a pilot program for Aboriginal family-led decision-making, and that is where you get a the model that we have decided to trial will be uh, an independent Aboriginal facilitator convening a meeting of the family, Aboriginal family, to see if we can get some safety, better safety outcomes and engagement by that family in relation to child protection. And that was the announcement that I was in Geraldton um, with the member for Geraldton with uh, last week, and, and that looks very promising. And I'd like to thank uh, uh, Professor. Um, oh, sorry. Um, Will Haywood from Curtin University and also Karina Martin from the Aboriginal Family Legal Service who have convened a group of Aboriginal leaders to design this, this work. Uh, and uh, we'll also have a, a pilot in the metropolitan area as well. But this is all leading in the direction that where we can we involve Aboriginal families and their representatives to try and prevent children coming into care. And if children are brought into care, um, that, that those uh, uh, families and their, and their representative organisations have a say on where the children are placed and to keep some cultural connection uh, with those, um, uh, with those uh, children. The Royal Commission into Child Sex Abuse identified that cultural connection, cultural identity is an important protective factor for Aboriginal children. I'm really proud that as the Minister for Child Protection over the last four years in the first McGowan government, um, as a result of some of that important work, we have now seen the first annual reduction of the number of non-Aboriginal children in care since 1998. So over 20 years, we've seen the first reduction of uh, non-Aboriginal children in care, and in fact, the, the rates of, of uh, Aboriginal children in care, the rates of growth for Aboriginal children in care is, is going in the right direction as well. It is, it is not a simple exercise, as I said, of just saying we will have less children in care. We need to make sure that children are safe, but we need to build the capacity of Aboriginal organisations and uh, Aboriginal families to be involved in the decision making so that children are safe, they're kept connected to their culture. 
uh, and uh, we get better outcomes for those young people and their families. Speaker. The member for Rowe. Madam Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Premier, I referred to question 57 yesterday, which you failed to answer, relating specifically to the qualifications and experience of the Chair of the Wagering and Gaming Commission, and I ask, one, can you confirm that Barry Sargent, a person with 25 years of gaming regulatory experience, had to leave the position of Chair due to your machinery of government changes? And two, can you confirm you replaced Mr Sargent with Duncan Ord as Chair of the Commission, a person with no gaming regulation, expertise, experience or training? Uh, just so you understand, because I said this yesterday, and I don't know what you're talking about, question 57, I don't know what that means. Uh, but in question any event, I asked yesterday. Uh, question 57? What does that mean? Uh, of this parliament, I expect. No. Yeah, I have no idea what you're talking about. Question 57. Madam Speaker, I've only been in here 24 years, but I don't know what question 57 is. Um, so, uh, just so you understand, I explained this to you yesterday. Mr Sargent recommended Mr Ord. He recommended Mr Ord for the role. So, uh, I was uh, keen to ensure Mr Sargent continued. Mr Sargent said to me, that, and, and I'll be frank with you, I'm quite good friends with Mr Sargent. Uh, he was um, the Director General when I was Minister back in 2005-2006. I had enormous respect for his abilities. He said to me he was going to retire. He recommended Mr Ord for the role. That's what occurred. So uh, Duncan Ord, a long-standing uh, public servant, a uh, person, uh, a very decent man, uh, highly respected, uh, dealing with a range of portfolio uh, responsibilities, as indeed do all, all uh, director generals in a range uh, of areas. Uh, it is the case uh, that in some portfolios in government you have people who are uh, generals. Uh, they might be know something about, you know, be a specialist, if you like, in one area of the portfolio, uh, and, but the portfolio is, is broad and they have deputy directors general, they have staff and the like to assist them, assist them uh, in those uh, in those areas, um, you know, it's often said, why isn't the, you know the, the minister for defence? Why don't you have an ex defence force member? Because uh, that's the nature of government. Uh, you get people into ministerial roles uh, who have a uh, a broad array of experiences and abilities, predominantly around uh, leadership and administrative uh, ability and responsibility to answering to a government and to a minister. You don't necessarily have someone who's an expert. The police commissioner is a serving police officer. That is always the case. Director General of Health is uh, almost uh, always a, uh, a doctor, but in other agencies across government you have people with a range of experiences uh, in uh, the roles in which they are, they are, they are placed uh, across, uh, across agencies. Uh, under the old system, the Director General of Sport didn't have to be an ex-sports person. Um, the head of local government didn't have to be a mayor. Um, it's just the nature of things uh, in, in government. Uh, otherwise, you would have to have literally scores, probably hundreds of government departments, with only people who had ever worked in that area uh, as uh, the director general of that agency. Uh, and what I was always advised when I studied uh, politics at university is sometimes it's better not to have a person uh, from uh, the area because they come with the view that they know better than their advisers. Um, so uh, that's why, um, that's why um, certainly in a ministerial sense, uh, but that's why um, Mr Ord was appointed uh, because he is recommended to me by Mr Sargent. Supplementary. Supplementary member for Rowe. Premier, given the annual report table by the previous Minister for Racing and Gaming states unequivocally that as a result of the 1 July 2017 machinery of government changes, Mr Barry Sargent will stand down as the chairman of the commission. Was it you or your minister who tabled this report in parliament that is wrong? The uh, order please, the premier. Mr Sargent was heading towards retirement in 2017. I'll explain it to you again. He was, I was very fond of Mr Sargent and still am. Uh, he has sat on the Salaries and Allowances Tribunal and I think a couple of other bodies for, for government uh, because he is very technically knowledgeable in a range of areas. But he was heading towards retirement. Uh, I said to him I'd like him to take on this role. He said I want to retire but I recommend Mr Ord. 
That is what he said to me. Um, and I'm sure he'd verify that. So we have subsequently set up a Royal Commission into events that have occurred in respect to Crown uh, over many years, including when you were in government. We did that. We set up the Royal Commission. The Royal Commission is now taking evidence and hearing matters and the like. Uh, but the idea that somehow a public servant is responsible uh, for what um, people inside uh, an organisation have done, I think, is a, um, a misunderstanding uh, of the role uh, of, uh, of uh, the public sector. Uh, if anyone has behaved inappropriately or wrongly inside a, a gambling organisation or a casino or what have you, well, that person is responsible for what they do. Now, in terms of um, the Royal Commission, of course, it will come down with recommendations. We'll let it do its, uh, do its work and undertake its, uh, uh, its duties and hear its evidence and so forth. It's all in public uh, because we're open and accountable and transparent and we've done something that you never did in your eight and a half years in office. The member for Church Lanes. Madam Speaker, my question is for the Minister for the Environment. I refer to the Commonwealth Government's recent announcement that it will invest $100 million in managing our oceans, sequestering carbon and helping address climate change. And I ask, can the Minister outline to the House how the McGowan Labor Government is seeking to work with the Commonwealth to ensure that Western Australia benefits from this investment in blue carbon ecosystems? Minister for Environment. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the member for the question and congratulate you on your election. Uh, my mum is very pleased to have a Labor member and to know that she's also not the only Labor voter in City Beach anymore. Really? Uh, as we know, blue carbon refers to carbon that's sequestered in marine environments, so that's seagrass, mangroves and tidal flats. And evidence shows that it can be up to four times more effective in capturing carbon than terrestrial environments. Um, and given Western Australia has so much coastline, um, we're in a very uh, good place to develop this industry. Uh, when UNESCO surveyed the 50 marine world heritage areas, they found that more than half of the blue carbon ecosystems across these sites uh, were in Australia, and two of them are in Western Australia with Ningaloo and Shark Bay. And Shark Bay has the world's largest and most diverse seagrass sea ecosystem. Uh, during the heat wave of 2010, the Shark Bay World Heritage Area actually lot, lost large areas of its seagrass, and that released what they um, estimate around nine megatons of, of carbon dioxide, which is the equivalent of two coal-fired power stations. Uh, we know that marine heat waves are becoming more common and longer due to the impacts of climate change. So restoring seagrass is really critical to it restoring the functioning of that ecosystem and so helping to sequester carbon from the atmosphere. Uh, the Shark Bay Mal Malgana Indigenous community are currently funded through the Aboriginal Ranger Program, and they've worked with scientists to develop a seeding and shooting planting methods to scale up our seagrass. Um, restoration activity, but despite our vast coastline, there are barriers to this, and one of those is the federal government. So when it comes to developing and accrediting new methods of carbon abatement, the federal government has left out seagrass from its priorities, focusing on mostly on mangrove environments, which are better on the, which are obviously more common on the east coast. Um, so that, that becomes really challenging for WA. And the accreditation process is really important because it attracts private investment, and without that we can't generate carbon credits, which are up to about $18 per tonne. Um, of carbon dioxide. Uh, last week, Madam Speaker, I informed the House that I'd written to the Commonwealth Minister <coughs> of Environment, Susan Lay, and requested that WA get our share of the $100 million and that we, WA is at least one of those four, uh, four major on-ground projects that was announced by the Commonwealth. Uh, if we're going to act on climate change as a country, we need Western Australia to be included in this national approach on carbon, on blue carbon, and we cannot afford to be left out. So, as Minister for Climate Action, I'll continue to work with the Premier to push for greater recognition of our potential in blue carbon, and I'll continue to. And the government will also continue to support uh, scientists and Aboriginal communities in working on our blue carbon ecosystems through the expanded Aboriginal Ranger Program and through the Carbon Innovation Grants and the Carbon Farming and Land Restoring Program. Thanks. That, that concludes question time.